Hey, thanks for joining us for Chew On This today. You are about to enter a discussion on how to actually live out faith in Christ, living it out loud in our messy lives. The content of this discussion comes from our Wednesday night crew and the pastoral preaching notes and the live small group discussion that these notes prompted, something we like to call a community-based learning experience. Come, chew on this with us. One question, can grief be good? This is Pastor Orlean Hasseltine along with Pastor Robin Bjornsson and our invisible producer, Nikki, who doesn't want to be seen over here, <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, welcoming you to today's chat, list giving, picking apart, identifying a topic we've all heard of, experienced, and definitely have been touched by. This topic was listed, chewed upon, <laughs> examined <laughs> on Wednesday night, February 10th. 10th here at Maranatha at the Forest Lake campus in this forgiveness series. And we specifically spent an entire evening discussing and listing and looking at and picking apart what grief looks like in the human experience. All of the notes that are being referred to are available on our website, realchurch.org forward slash Wednesday nights. Thank you very much, Michelle. They're all posted and ready to go. Lots of lists. And I want to let you know on, on every topic when we get to the managing part, I tried to put on the, the, the actual paper the list of helps. And some of them are redundant because they're on every single one. So we will talk about them today during the podcast. But if you don't hear it said for a specific one, that means it's on the list for everything. I will try to make that really clear. But letting our, our viewers and our listeners know that there are, are different types of things to try to help manage the grief and a lot of them are, are replicatable, and some are very specific. So I'll try to stay with the specific ones on that topic, but those ones that apply to everything, we will just say continue, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, for those of you who are the King and I fans. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Yul Brenner. I can see go. his face. Oh, yeah, and the dancing. Mm. You need to see the original one that is really dark and disturbing. Oh, Yeah, the King is not very happy. Anyway, oh. that's a different topic for a different <laughs> conversation. <laughs> yes. We are on this amazing topic, topic of forgiveness. We began here in Luke 17, looking at forgiveness as worship. It really is an act of worship. It is part of us showing and allowing the process of our salvation to permeate into our mindset, into our relationships. It's actually forgiveness is a Jesus infusion. We are pro processing what he has shown us how to do. So we began with forgiveness as worship, which is a great, and I think the best place to start. That is new this time out. We've talked about this topic. We pull it up probably, it seems like, every five years or so, and it probably should be done annually because it is so pertinent to everyday experience. But this time, this one was added, giving the, the right mindset when we enter in. I'm not going to learn to do to forgiveness because it makes everything better. No, forgiveness is part of how I worship Jesus Christ. So we began with that puzzle piece. Then we added that wonderful list from Boundaries, what forgiveness is and what it is not. So you don't get confused thinking, oh, if I forgive them, it means I have to forget everything that happened. Well, I have not yet met a human who can forget, especially a traumatic experience at the hand of another. So that isn't what forgiveness is about. Jesus isn't asking us to not be human. Jesus is not asking us to not be human. He's asking us to process our humanity through him. So I love those lists. <laughs> forgiveness is a lot of list. I just realized that. <laughs> <laughs> then we looked at this amazing thing of anger, the blessing of anger. It is related to good grief, which is the topic for today's podcast. But the blessing of anger, anger is a blessing. It's the pop-up button that we have been disturbed. Something in the force is disturbing us, and we need to do something about it. That was just for you, <laughs> Pastor Star Robin. Wars reference. Yes, yes we, we got that. <laughs> yes. And then forgiving oneself. It is, <laughs> it is hard to process through when you can't forgive yourself. You mm -hmm. just get stuck in the, the, that little eddy of yourself. Mm -hmm. That is also a process. So we're taking all these pieces and putting them into our forgiveness puzzle. We're waiting. Pastor, oh, tell me how to. Um, we are telling you how to. There's all these pieces because you're never sure which is the nuance that is going to open the door and allow a lot of the angst or a lot of the questioning and a lot of that to flow through. So there is another one, this idea of forgiving oneself. And then in the last, last week's, Wednesday night and the last week's podcast, we talked about living in equity, living in equality. What does it mean to view ourselves and someone else as same, same? That we are seen by God as individuals with the same value, the same uh, 
respect given by him, and we should replicate that respect for one another. And we all say, well, of course, you know, I see myself equal to others or others equal to me. But there's times when we really struggle with that. And so, believe it or not, Pastor Robin, there's lists I love in that, it. that show us, <laughs> well, wait a minute, I have felt that way. Mm -hmm. You mean I think I'm operating with the understanding that I think that person's better than me? Mm -hmm. And when we do that, we allow infractions, if you will, sometimes even abuse when we think the other person has the right to do that. Mm -hmm. Those things have to be dealt with in order to get to forgiveness. Mm -hmm. When you finally identify what they did was wrong, ooh, hard, but amazing, mm -hmm. because we need to be able to do that. Or on the other hand, what I did was wrong. Ooh. Mm -hmm. So that was a wonderful conversation about living in equity. And today that brings us to the topic of good grief. And yes, I am fully aware that is a peanut phrase. I Yay, <laughs> Charles Schultz. I can't help it. It has to be in here good because group, it really Charlie is Russ. good. And there is nothing like, you know, the peanut cartoon to help you understand how to enjoy how to enjoy a topic that is hard. We just had a little visitor, but that's all right. It's good. <laughs> Jenny. <laughs> we need to come up with some sign language. Right. How Our producer is very much in demand. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So there, that sets us up for today's podcast and today's discussion that we have in this family here at Maranatha, as you can tell. <laughs> Pastor O, yes. um, it reminds me, as you, as you walk through this, you know, uh, whether it's uh, the topic of forgiveness, you know, we so look for process, this idea of it being linear, when in fact, what I'm seeing is more, instead of a linear thing to walk through forgiveness in a healthy way, as if we were going from one station to the next station to the next station, I'm seeing a mind map. You know, this is forgiveness, but it includes all of these different interwoven components. Yes. So, yes. That might be, you make some amazing illustrations when you're working out a process and a new system mm. with your color coding. I think that would be an interesting graphic to develop some, you know, mm -hmm. some year down the road. <laughs> Get Somebody, the colors out. One of those nights when nobody can sleep and, right. hey, are you up? Let's work on this. <laughs> yeah. So we're looking at grief, this idea of understanding. Uh, Dr. Henry Cloud in one of his books has this amazing uh, quote. The patterns you learn at home growing up are continued into adulthood. We know this, yay or nay, it's there. Your family members are the ones you learn to organize your life around. So they are able to send you back to old patterns by their very presence. And you can begin to act automatically out of memory instead of growth. That process is applicable to so many things in our life. And do not make the mistake of feeling like you used to as I have not grown. You get back into a triggering, situa triggering situation, mm -hmm. and you feel like, what? Well, well haven't I? Well, 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 of course you have. All of a sudden, somebody is touching the scar that may or may not be really healed, and it's like, oh, we, oh, that's right. There's a scar there, because that was a hard one, and that's all it is. Feelings are amazing, and when we talk about grief, I love doing that for those in the audience. I know I know almost everybody that's there, so it's wonderful. <laughs> and the ones that emotions are just uh, crying, well, whatever. But you can look at this one. When we deal with grief, feelings are an indicator. Mm -hmm. Just like with anger, with grief, feelings don't lead what you do. They're just this, oops, something's going on. I need to notice. Um, you know, did I, did I forget to take my pajama pants off today? That feeling of feelings are this indicator that something is going on. So when we have these experiences, a feeling sometimes it's just indicating, oh, somebody touched that scar. Sometimes it is a brand new process of grief that needs to be worked through. Where did that feeling come from? And that's what they're used for. They're still at the caboose of our life. We don't make decisions based on our feelings. But we definitely, especially in this process, need to recognize they are very important. So it was wonderful to bring that out last night. I also wanted to make a very strong statement that I personally believe that our forgiveness process gets stuck because we don't pay attention to grief. We don't allow it. We don't recognize it. We try to hide it. We try to stuff it. We try to out activity it, depending on our personality. We just don't want, because like you said, it's inconvenient. Yeah. <laughs> oh, grieve, I don't think so. I was done with that years ago. Exactly. And no, nope, guess what? There's a new process stuck in the corner in your mind or in your heart, and out it's going to come. We just get to manage it. We can't tell it what to do. <laughs> And you know, I think too, Pastor Aline, the uh, the gift is friends. 
that we can be. You know, when we see some of this stuff going on in others' lives, um, we can lovingly comfort. Yes. Because I recognize in the material that we've been going through in the Forgive series, some of this stuff is like background uh, software that's running, and you don't realize that that's back there. Yes. But maybe a friend recognizes, oh, yes. They're grieving this transition or this loss or whatever. So it's great when people can reflect that to us because sometimes this stuff happens and we don't even recognize yes. to see, to find identification. Yeah, it just feels like life is upside down. How right. could it do this to me? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, not that I've ever experienced that, but you know, just something <laughs> like that. As we begin again, I would like to uh, share the scripture verse that we're using for the series. It's out of Colossians chapter 1. Verses 13 and 14. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness. Amen. And he's transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, comma, in whom we have redemption, amen, and the forgiveness of sins. So we can have this conversation in the way we're going to have it because of this process. This idea of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and we will be discussing this process ad nauseum when we get into soteriology, which will be our next series, which is the salvation theory, salvation principles, this idea of what happens in that amazing experience that we call salvation, looking at the supernatural to the natural, we get to have the discussion we're having today because of Jesus's death, burial, and resurrection and what he left accessible to us. So yes, we are human. It doesn't negate us being human. You cannot pretend you don't have human experiences. I mean, this is all really a gift from him, but he is here to walk through it with us, not to remove us from it, you can't, I mean, you can't, and you can have as many tantrums as you want as a grown-up. It's not really pleasant to watch or be part of, but you can see them. And you go, oh, God, you got to do this. It's like, no, he wants us to be in his presence and worship him, to worship him. And that's where forgiveness is an act of worship. You're here, Jesus. I don't have to do this alone. I have a supernatural Savior who wants to mess in my natural and walk with me. Mm -hmm. And I know, for those who've never access to any of this. This sounds really crazy. And it sounds crazy, but it's true. Wherever you get the idea that something is perfect or the, the uh, understanding that you can love, where in the world do those concepts come from if we don't have a supernatural side of ourselves? Because there's nothing in society, in this whole world experience, that's perfect. The closest we probably get is a newborn baby. But it's not perfect. There's no perfect, but we still have this concept that motivates or depresses us, depending on where you apply it. Mm -hmm. And the, this quest for love, love and relationship and companionship, where does that come from? So looking at this process and the gift we've been given as we enter into examining good grief, the inability to forgive is often driven by this pessimism in life that nothing is ever going to progress beyond our current grief. So why in the world should I even start? Let's just hide it, stick it to the back, because the more you ignore it, it'll just go away. And then you don't have to do the process, right? <laughs> Big fat lie. You're just delaying it, making it drag on and go forever. <laughs> because we are going to pick this crap back up again, and we are going to look at it because grief is good. It is good. It's an outlet. It is the hose or the channel for trauma, despair, emotional pain to travel through us to get it out so it does not control us. So those are the choices we get. Either don't deal with it and it controls us or deal with it and it comes through us and it helps us grow up and it helps us become a more empathetic and sympathetic person. It also, Pastor Arlene, helps us live in a world that we were not designed to live in. There you go. You remind good, us that this process. is not heaven. Yes. This is not heaven. And I see the grief process as a gift from the Lord that helps us work through the pain that comes with living in a fallen world. Yes. Mm -hmm. Amen. Preach it, Pastor Rob. me. Come on, girl. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's for all the Wednesday night crew because we, <laughs> we practice the hurt me. All righty. Defining grief. I love the, 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 uh, the PowerPoint that was put up on the trans last night because <laughs> grief is good. Let's define it. It's totally amazing the definition that was put up on the tron it just yes let me sign up for that here we go here is the, the the definition of grief sorrow misery sadness anguish pain distress agony heartache desolation despondency dejection angst remorse woe suffering affliction regret despair and lamentation yes it's 
good. <laughs> All of these strong, intense feelings, strong, intense emotions, strong, intense experiences are part of the grief process. This is why it is probably one of the number one ways for forgiveness to get stuck, because we don't deal with our grief. You cannot stop grief. You can stuff it, but you don't stop it. It is still there screaming. The best thing we could do is manage it. In scripture, you're not going to see the word grief too often because grief is a noun. Grief is a noun. The word in scripture, Pastor Robin, do you know what that word is in scripture? That, mm -mm. Uh, it starts with an M and you read it all the time. Matthew 5, 4 puts it this way. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. The word mourning is an actual verb. It's grief in action. So that is what scripture uses. It talks about grief in process. That, that is what us New King Jamers who like to, yeah, that's mourning. And mourning is the word that you find in almost all the translations. And that's not like good mourning, but it, it's mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. So when we look at scripture to look for helps when it comes to the grieving process and being in that type of despair, we are looking at the word in the process mourn or mourning. Matthew 5, 4, blessed are those who mourn. This is a promise. It is, it is in the Beatitudes. Jesus is saying this. Is, this is Jesus' first public sermon when he's out there talking and expressing with others. And he says, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. It's on page two if you're looking at your notes, ladies. And it's our, it's our promise. If we mourn, we shall be comforted. And Jesus isn't talking about just a human comfort. Jesus is talking about comfort coming from him, this supernatural comfort. So there is a wonderful promise and motivation that we should engage in the process of working through our grief. There is this supernatural connection that he's going to walk with us through this. Thank Amen. you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. So can grief be a natural reaction to any loss? All right, I had to ask that because sometimes we think, well, that wasn't that big a deal. How in the world can I be grieving that? So there were some things that we, I threw out some of them are, are very, a serious illness, of course. Uh, a loss of a friendship? Well, of course, it's a loss. The death of a pet? We had some heads shaking and some mm -hmm. going like this. Mm -hmm. Of course it can. The selling of your home, moving from one place to the, to the, graduating from college. The end of the Christmas season, watch a little kid who was so excited for this, or a kid, or grown-ups, who like their birthday. And when it's done, it's like, oh, it's a sense of loss. It's a little sense of loss, mm -hmm. but it's still a sense of loss. Mm -hmm. a betrayal is a huge one, huge sense of loss. I had this dream and someone just killed it. So it is a death in your life. Mm -hmm. Changing jobs, there can mm -hmm. be grief, even if you like the job you're going to. Obviously, any type of death or miscarriage, that type of loss, we would say yes. Um, the losing of financial stability. We're going through a society where everything has been tossed up right now due to COVID. And then divorce of relationships or breakups. Obviously, all of those things can, and there's the list can go on and on. Your feelings, your reaction to something is going to tell you if you're grieving. Sometimes the grieving can be a short cycle. Sometimes it's a mm -hmm. big spaghetti pile sitting on a plate. So, I, I'm ahead, glad you brought up COVID too, Pastor Arlene, because really this is incredible timing to go through this particular topic in the forgiveness, uh, forgive series, because I think as... A culture, as a nation, as a world. Yes. We're grieving and most of us don't know it. Yes, good point. That is true. And that was part of the conversation. Do you, I know how I grieve? What mm -hmm. does my grief look like? Mm -hmm. You do have pretty much a systemic process. It's a little different. You don't go through step one, step two, step three. It doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. You go through the process attached. Here is where I start. This grief looks like this. This one's going to be a big one. It's probably going to cover all of these things. This one is a smaller one. It's going to be more of a cycle. And then the other one's going to be a, a plate of spaghetti. But your body, your mind, your feelings, all of that are going to have a system, in my personal opinion, mm -hmm. that you are going to be able to notice, wait a minute, is this grief? This is how I felt when this happened. There's, there's a resemblance. And being able to note that so you are prepared to understand, all right, I'm in for a bumpy ride. Let me manage these things that are coming up, get them out of the way as fast as I can, <laughs> which is kind of, you know, an oxymoron when you're mm -hmm. talking about grief. Right. But acknowledge them and see where they go as fast as I can. So I will let myself grieve my losses and not waste time denying that I'm in grief or mm -hmm. just not even, excuse me, not even noticing because you're busy. 
So how would I know what does grieving look like in my life? It's okay to grieve. Not all of us believe that. Not all of us were taught that. Not all of us were given this opportunity growing up in our family that it is okay to do this. So our first initial reaction when we notice these feelings are to stuff them, deny them, hide them. Because holy cow, who's going to want anybody to see those things? And culturally, yes. um, you know, when you look at the globe, people process grief and they handle grief as a community very differently. True. And there's what I would call kind of a systemic impatience in the United States with this. I mean, it's been a year. Come on, get yes. over this. Oh, yes. When other cultures recognize this is a complete, yes. the sky is now green and the grass is blue, change of pace. So it yes. may be or it may not be. but Yes, yeah. I think that's a great observation. So here's our starting point looking at this. I grieve, you grieve, it is a human condition, depending on our background, the process that we know, on what actually happened, the culture we live in, the timing in our life, what's going on in society around us, it all affects the grieving process. Our job is to notice it, to define it, and then to manage our grief. There's three steps. We need to notice, define, and then manage. That, that's about all we're going to do. Jesus is going to walk through it with us if we invite him in, which is one of the management steps, but we're not there yet. First, we're going to notice grief reactions can contain. What can grief reactions contain? Here's lots of lists today. Here's our list. There is a sense of hopelessness that just nags on and on. I, like, I'm normally not like this. That's an indicator. Grief is, is around and working in your world. There's a withdrawal. You don't want to be bothered. And I'm not talking about the introversion withdrawal where, hey, I've had enough. I need to separate myself to recharge my batteries because then your batteries get recharged and, hey, I can have a new human contact again. Mm -hmm. It's just a withdrawal and there is no recharging. So there is this withdrawal. There's a loss of joy. Mm -hmm. That is a huge indicator. And that loss of joy can last a long time, especially if it's, the grief is attached to a trauma. Mm -hmm. It takes time to heal and have a new life because once we go through a grief process we are not the same we are now a different person because we've gone through this process so that takes time so there is a loss of joy realizing wait a minute why am i like this or why does this seem so despondent no matter what i do i can't seem to find any joy lack of enthusiasm regarding your own good fortune or someone else's there's just okay there's just the okay Ooh, that's a hard one. Feeling distant from God and wondering if he's really there. Pastor, oh, I pray and it seems like my prayers are hitting the ceiling and falling back on my head. Definite indicator we need to pay attention to because I could be in a grief process. Difficulty in cheering up, pessimism about the future, feeling very physically ill as well as emotionally drained all of the time. A sad mood that's more prominent than normal for your personality, reminiscing about the past because the present and the future don't seem to be too pleasant. Feelings of hurt of emotional pain that do not readily cycle out and go away. My feelings are hurt, blah, blah, okay, now I'm better. Grief will tell you, nope, there's more work to do, because it's more than your feelings that were hurt. There's a process in your life that has been disrupted or changed. Fixation on the offending, what the offending party deserves. That's a huge one with all of us as we process. They caused this, they deserve this, they... And the grief process needs to be allowed to flow through so you can actually get to the forgiveness process, which doesn't mean that person didn't do anything wrong or that you are now erasing everything they've done. Yes, we know that when we forgive someone, we are doing it for our attachment to the problem. We're letting God take care of the rest of those details. Mm -hmm. So going through that, it's a wonderful checklist to analyze. Okay, is this happening? And it doesn't take very long. Usually you already know, and when someone brings it up, are you grieving? It's like, boom. Puzzle piece snapped into place for my mm -hmm. fine self. Mm -hmm. I bet I am. I didn't realize that this was that difficult or, or I missed it this much. I have been so, not surprised, but overwhelmed because this COVID stuff has gone on for so long that my small group faces, the ones that I have not been able to see and touch, I am now, all right, I'm calling you. We need to FaceTime. We need to figure something out because I can't go deprivation therapy. And I am a committed introvert, but I haven't seen and inhaled my people let alone lick their cheeks. But I have decided that's probably not appropriate anymore. <laughs> so there we go for my age and our society. So looking at this sense of loss and what it gets attached to. So I have figured out, okay, this feeling of melancholy, which I would call it, mm. is attached to, I've missed these 
these people so much and making sure I am texting, talking, and then if I need to, actually doing some FaceTime with them because I need to. The, the next step is actually being able to touch and hold them but and hug them, but that is not here yet for quite a few of them. So looking at how we, how we process grief and seeing the little flags pop up in our life. Oh, yellow flag, this is going on. Oh, here's a red flag, I need to pay attention to that. So number one, that is the number one thing we do analyzing grief in our life. We go through the notice, am I grieving? Could it be grief? Then we define what is grief. All right, so this is going on. So what is grief and what stages does it go through to process and get out of my world or process and help me grow? I guess that's the better way. Mm. It doesn't go anywhere. It just processes you through so you can grow. This is, I believe she was a Swedish doctor. I read her name. I think it's Kathy, something with a K, who came up with this process to help oh. in her practice. And she was surprised how people grabbed onto it and how it became this measurement standard. It was never her intent. Mm. It was for, but it is really interesting because it's so applicable to humankind. We do not go through it in order, although sometimes we can, but these are the, the stages and they're going to be listed in this order, another list. Number one is denial. This cannot be happening to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all the way from a two-year-old who someone took their favorite toy, this cannot be happening to me, comes across a little differently at that stage. <laughs> Might involve sitting on the floor and pounding your feet and doing things like that, although as a grown-up you can do it, it just is not really socially acceptable anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it means to uh, refuse, deprive, withhold, begrudge, reject, I'm not going to do this. Why is this happening? I'm stuck in the why is this, why is this? It is a huge process depending on the trauma or, or what you're working through. The biggest cost of denial is it just delays the process of getting to forgiveness. So it, it draws it out. It just draws it out longer. Yay, sign me up for more of that, won't you? Mm -hmm. Also involved in denial, looking at some other resources, I love this, this idea of shock and denial. This list I had found on someone else's uh, psychological whatever list of grieving. I love the idea of shock. Mm -hmm. Like Yes, attaching that word to this process, depending on what it is, mm -hmm. you can stay in shock for a really long time, mm -hmm. depending on your personality and depending on what has happened. Mm -hmm. And you just, you're just you just numb. You feel like a zombie. Mm -hmm. You're just numb in disbelief. It's like, really, really? I have experienced this myself. I have watched others. Mm -hmm. And it is unbelievable. And it, you can't make shock stop. <laughs> you can... You can all of these, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. You just can't make it stop. I'm done with you, shock. I'm done. Be gone. Be gone, Bad shock. Dream. Be gone, yeah. yes. <laughs> but it's there. Uh, there are, we will be getting to the managing principles in a moment mm -hmm. and, and telling us how we can help manage it so it does move, move on. But if you just stay in den denial and you just stay in this little eddy of step, step denial, step one, if we will say that, this cannot be happening to me that you live numb for a really, really long time. Mm -hmm. Some individuals can never get past this, depending on what, what mm -hmm. the issue was. Mm -hmm. And they live there for the rest of their life. How hard, oh, hard yeah. and oh, sad yeah. and unnecessary. Mm -hmm. And this is where I said it a few times last night, big fan of counseling and therapy. Yeah, amen. We talked about the role of antidepressants if needed. Just there is a process of getting through depending on your personality, your physical health, and the trauma that you're processing mm -hmm. through. I, I think most, in my opinion, feel free to disagree, that most anti-anxiety medicine or depression medication, there's a, a general populace where they get us from point A to point B and they're not needed any longer. That's how I see most of them being used. Mm -hmm. And then there's the individuals, we might as well get it out here now because you know not everybody agrees with this, where it actually replaces something your body no longer processes. Mm -hmm much like a diabetic taking insulin. There are individuals where their body doesn't, th these two connectors don't talk to each other anymore because mm -hmm. this thing isn't there mm -hmm. or never was there. Mm -hmm. And boy, praise God for the beautiful minds that have figured out all we need to do is get receptor A to talk to receptor D. And that will mean then that they will be able to process this through. And that would be an individual who needs to be on them for the rest of their life. And that is a conversation, not between them and the church. That is a conversation between them and their doctor them and their therapists. Amen. I am so glad you brought that up too, Pastor Orlean, because there are so many that attach, first off, receiving any assistance in, in this sort of process um, uh, as, I don't know, 
a, a, sh- a, sh- a point of shame. Yes. Or lesser than. Yes. You know, I should or be s- or sin. They almost yeah. treat it like it's sinful. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not mature enough. Right, or as you don't Christian, have faith big Christian. enough. Yes, there you go. You know? Yes. If your and, faith was larger, you wouldn't be good. Yes. Oh. Exactly. And yes. so uh, just the whole, no, actually, if you need support, you need support. Have a yes. conversation with people who have training in this area to bring you the assistance that you need yes. for this time frame. Yeah, I loved that. So denial can be very long or very short or whatever your body decides, but pay attention to shock. There's also pain and guilt attached to the denial factor. That the loss is unbearable. You you feel guilty because of you maybe have contributed to this this trauma that's happened to you. It can just just be aware that pain and guilt are in here through the whole process. Mm-hmm. They lessen, praise God, mm-hmm. but they are part of it. Anger after denial. This cannot be happening to me. Then there's anger. Why is this happening to me? And this is where we start telling God that. Don't you see me? What's going on? <laughs> You're irritated. There's actual fury attached to this. Mm-hmm. Resentment, ire, wrath. That just beyond annoyance. You are so irritated. Why is this happening to me? You have to you have to ask the question. Mm-hmm. You have to process through. Mm-hmm. There may not be a whole lot of answers, but you definitely have to realize that that will come up. Most of the time, not every single time, depending on the, the stimuli, but most of the time you're going to have a sense of anger. I appreciate these two, particularly together, denial and the anger. As I was working through the notes, what really hits me is this idea of when I'm dreaming, when I'm planning, I don't plan to be interrupted by grief. I don't plan to be interrupted by the death of a dream. I don't plan to be interrupted at my, when you dream, you just dream this. And I don't think to factor in plan B or plan D or plan Z. (laughs) <laughs> right? Yes. And now yes. as an old woman, um, I'm looking through this and going, oh, yeah, that'd be wise to remember when I dream, mm-hmm. it won't mm-hmm. always end up looking like I expect. <laughs> Surprise. And that will help with the denial and the anger. Mm-hmm. Yes. So what? guess what happens when anger wants to reformat itself? Mm. Anger becomes bargaining. So you get the fury of the anger, and then it comes, okay, God, or... This or I, if I do this, okay. What about this? Um, I, this should happen. So the, these feelings or this process, I don't have to deal with this. Lord, make this happen. So we start coming up with these scenarios and start asking God, or just start talking about it, depending on whether or not you have acknowledged God is real. Make this not happen, and then I will. I will serve you forever. I will never do that again. I will. This anger turns its fine little self into bargaining. Mm-hmm. It is still anger, however. <laughs> So we have the denial, which includes shock, and there's sometimes pain and guilt. We have anger. We have bargaining. And then there comes this, all this activity, and then here comes the depression. I'm just too sad to do anything. I cannot do anything. And this is where we need to involve people in our grief process to keep tabs on us. I am fine with 48 hours of wallowing in sadness. That's for me. I can do two days, but if it goes beyond two days where I haven't been able to feel a sense of God's presence or find a conversation with a trusted individual helpful, then I need to make another step of fixing and helping and paying attention and, and give it more importance. I give That is for me. We need to know our grieving process well enough where because this one right here, if we do not pay attention, it can steal years of your life. Right. But it, depression has to be managed and has to be addressed. Mm-hmm. So uh, inside this conversation of depression, there are some other subpoints listed on other sites and other books in the research that I've done where they call this the upward turn. We're dealing with depression. Then all of a sudden, there's that. We're not quite to acceptance yet, but there's depression and there's a small shift. They called it the upward turn. You start being able to breathe again amidst the pain. Maybe you laughed out loud at something funny. Maybe you actually initiated a phone call. You're beginning to exhale some of the pain from controlling your life, realizing, I have a great life. I want my life to go back to what it was or back to what it can be now. That just, it's a tiny little turn, but it's an important thing, I think, to notice in the grief process. Otherwise, we feel like we haven't done enough. It's like, no, all we have to do is manage it. You can't fix it. You can't force it to go through any faster. You just need to recognize, oh, look, I laughed. Oh, look, I want to go have coffee with someone. That wonderful part of reconstruction and working through to what life is going to look like now 
I can get things back together and it looks like I'm going forward. Instead of turning in those circles, all of a sudden we stop and we start step one. That's the upward turn. I am not wallowing in my spaghetti plate of grief mess. I'm making a step. And believe it or not, that's an amazing part of the grief process. I have now allowed it. It's out. I've gotten those emotions that just get in the way of everything sometimes. And now I'm able to see, I like my life. I like where I can go. There mm -hmm. is a future here. Mm -hmm. May not know all of the details of it, but I'm going to go in that direction. So I like that depression has been unpacked and puts some more definitive, smaller steps in it. Because otherwise, it's either I'm depressed or not. So I'm still in depression because I haven't done this. It's like, no, you've made the turn. I've seen you do this. I've seen you do this. It's really helpful with self-management to understand. Yeah, this this strikes me as uh, the recognition that I am getting my bearings. Yes, good point. You yes. know, I'm just kind of getting yeah. my bearings. Where I thought maybe I couldn't breathe, I have three days behind me where I actually did breathe. You know, just yes. whatever yes. it may be. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and then the very last stage, which I think most people know, is acceptance. I've made peace with what has happened. I don't have to approve of it. I don't have to like it. I have made peace and realized Jesus is going to work through me and be in my life. His presence is still with me. Mm -hmm. I am going forward. I don't want to stay here. And you'll notice this because hope returns. Mm -hmm. Hope is a wonderful exclamation point at the end of a grief cycle that there is hope. Mm -hmm. I, and it's like, good, life can go forward from here. So that is our noticing what grief looks like in our life, and then defining what grief does. This is These are the stages of grief, what they can look like. Not that we conquer every stage or that we grow through or we go through each and every one in order or that we go through all of them each and every time. No, we don't graduate. We don't conquer. We just manage and know that it's going on. And that wonderful point we said at the beginning of the podcast that different things can trigger all those emotions we just worked our way through. And once we identify and know we've done the hard work, oh, that's just, that's just a tender spot that got hit because this person looks the same mm -hmm. as that. Or that's just a tender spot because now I'm here and that person isn't here with me. Holidays are a huge trigger mm -hmm. if, in the loss of a loved one, right. looking at that type of stuff. Or the promotion you didn't get and the person who got it, mm -hmm. and then you run into them in Walmart. Yeah, and you really just go down the other aisle because I'm not ready to look you in the face, especially if you feel that they had to, yeah, that whole mess. So 2 Corinthians 7.10. The other verse we'll be looking at in this podcast on this topic. <laughs> okay, this happened last night. I am done with these. These ones, I, I reuse my things, yeah. but these ones don't. I pull on it, and it comes off. It doesn't turn the page in my Bible. <laughs> so they are now dead to me. They're going in the garbage after today's podcast because I had it marked. I did, I did, I did, I tell you. And for those of us who really appreciate office supplies, I totally yes. feel your pain. Yes. So I love office supplies. Mm -hmm. Me and sticky notes. Like that. If I could have invented anything, it would have been the tape realm. Tape and sticky notes and tabs. I love that stuff. And then really cool pens, because, you know, what's the, the use of having a post-it note without a pen to write on it? Right. <laughs> Here we go. Back to the topic of grief. Second Corinthians 7.10 says this. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. That sounds like a really embracing scripture, Pastor Orlean. Yeah, it really is, because godly grief produces something. It is what leads us to, to salvation and repentance. Yes, we're going through a grief process before we get saved. A grief process brings us to Jesus. Grief produces something. Praise God, there is a promise for you. Your grief is going to produce something if you go through the cycle. Amen. So, Praise God, I may not like it. It's part of the human experience because I deal with other human beings and I deal with my own humanity and I'm in this well because of their choice, my choice, our choice, whatever it is. And so now we get to manage it. We understand what the grief cycle looks like and now we get to manage. There's all these indicators of things that we can manage that help us get through or help us live while it is processing. The number one thing is inviting Jesus into my grief. Whether you know Jesus intimately or not, I want to encourage you that this is the time. This is his specialty. Because grief is what leads us to our need for him, to understand this human experience. We're not meant to live with all this evil. And he is here to help us walk through now that it is here. And it will be gone eventually in the end of time as we know it. Another conversation on eschatology. Ooh, that could be a fun topic to chew on. <laughs> <laughs> They've got lots of really big words. Antinomianist is a big word that belongs in eschatology. <laughs> 
We never use it anywhere else. <laughs> Rarely <laughs> see it. It's worth it. Would you say it's a hundred dollar word? Oh, Maybe $100. one of those big ones because you can't. But here we start with the grief, managing our grief by inviting Jesus into it. You could how how would you invite Jesus into a situation in your life, Pastor Robin? <laughs> um, usually uh, with excited utterance. It usually comes like. Oh, Jesus, I need your help. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it's yes. not, yes. oh, Jesus, oh, I need yeah. your help. I'm throwing some glitter on you. Yeah, and holy water, don't forget that. Oh, that's right. Oh, <laughs> oh. But no, yes. it usually yes. is, I need your help. Jesus, I need mm-hmm. some help. Mm-hmm. So, Which is a wonderful holy prayer, flash mm-hmm. prayers. Mm-hmm. Uh, help now. Yes. I love when uh, in texting and you, you get the report of something that really hard happened. Yes. My response is usually Jesus, comma, help, exclamation mm-hmm. point. Yeah. And that's what we need. We're inviting him into our grief. Jesus, mm-hmm. I need your help. Mm-hmm. However that looks for you. Sometimes after the phrase goes through your head or you utter a prayer, I encourage you to say it out loud with your lips. Yes. It helps resonate brain science. It helps resonate in your being when you do that. But there is also, I know individuals were listening to Christian music. They, yes. they listen to music and it takes scripture Mm-hmm. and puts it to notes. It's like poetry going into your being. Mm-hmm. For some, there's uh, being able to read the Bible, reading his word. <clears throat> Believe it or not, there are some individuals who the trauma has been so intense, they can't read because it's just a mumble jumble. Their eyes can't focus. So I've encouraged them, because they understand what's in their Bible, to sleep with it, mm. to put it next to their pillow so at night they can at least touch it. That mm-hmm. it's there and realizing that Jesus is there with them. They may not be able to read his word, mm-hmm. or you can listen to the, the word mm-hmm. on tape on Audible. You can, on tape, I'm old. You can listen to the word <laughs> <laughs> on Audible. Sorry about that. It used to be on tape. <laughs> then it was on CD. Well, now it's in an MP3 file, so there you go. <laughs> so those types of things, even journaling, mm-hmm. that type of process, anything that helps you understand your supernatural Savior is part of your natural world. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Each and every one of these, and there's 10 of them, I believe, on managing our grief, just going to say it out loud, one, therapist and counselor can be a part of any process, and two, self-care is a part of any process. Right. You have to take care of yourself. And this is where inviting in uh, your group of support people to help you not lie to yourself. So that one will come up in, in a, few more, uh, a few more different lists coming up later here in the podcast. But managing our grief, inviting Jesus into my grief, dealing with my anger, Seeing that anger is a blessing and is a gift, it's there. We actually uh, did a podcast on it prior to this one, so talking about the, the blessing of anger. And then we can recognizing shock. We've talked a bit about that with our list that we just went through. That shock is a blunt force experience. It is really difficult. And the number one thing we need when we're in shock is that we need others to be around us so we don't do anything that we shouldn't mm-hmm. that is I, I just am so numb. I just need you to be with me. And that's it. Mm-hmm. You might be the person getting them coffee. You might be mm-hmm. the person helping them get out of their pajamas that they've been wearing for five days, maybe changing <coughs> undergarments that need to be changed. It is that simple of a thing and that hard of a thing. Mm-hmm. But recognizing that shock, that's part of managing our grief. We need to recognize it and get help for the things that will cost us in the long run. Allowing sadness. Allowing yourself to be sad, to however sadness looks in your personality. Pastor Robin, when you are really sad, do you know what you do? How do you act? Are you someone where tears come easy? Are you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, tears will come. Uh, I, I find, uh, yeah, when I'm, when I'm sad, uh, it, it's not unusual to cry. It's not unusual to sit down with my journaling notebook and my Bible yeah. and just start having a conversation with the Holy Spirit, yes. finding those scriptures and and um, uh, processing the sadness. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. And it's great. We need to know what we're like when we're sad. Mm-hmm. I isolate and withdraw. I need mm-hmm. to be alone, mm-hmm. but I can't be alone too long. Right. I find that art is, a, and I'm not an artist per se. I like to write, but even sketching, anything like that. Mm-hmm. I'm not a color by number person. Mm-hmm. So you do not need to purchase me. <laughs> I end up giving them away. They're great. Mm-hmm. But I find myself <laughs> having anxiety over mm-hmm. them or painting. Mm-hmm. Anxiety. Mm-hmm. I don't know where that comes from. It's just, I, love, I, love, I, mean, I just, it is not my art form. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. love seeing that, but it really does help with allowing sadness to just be mm-hmm. and work its way through. Then one of the other things about managing grief is recognizing misplaced shame or embarrassment. Sometimes we accept the shame of the situation when it wasn't ours. Right. That we don't need to be ashamed to hurt, to mourn. 
And it's interesting that our ability to forgive turns into an inability when we hang on to shame and embarrassment. The inability to forgive often exists in direct proportion to the tendency to hold on to the unnecessary shame or embarrassment. And this is huge, especially when it comes to childhood sexual trauma. Mm-hmm. You're not going to tell anybody that happened to you, mm-hmm. especially my age and older. Mm-hmm. But it needs, to be, it needs to be out of your being. It needs to be done in a safe place. There needs to be support. And I would advise a wonderful support process, therapeutic process, counseling process. It is not your fault. You were traumatized by someone evil. You had absolutely nothing to do it except you survived. Amen. And you're going to survive with glory Amen. and get that process. When we don't, when we stick in the shame and embarrassment, we're phony. It inhibits us having any honesty in our relationships with others. It puts your pain in a little worship chest inside your body. So your pain becomes part of your character. It keeps you from being honest with yourself. So when we look at managing our grief, that we need to recognize whether or not this is my shame and my embarrassment. I didn't do anything. I did nothing wrong. And I have to tell you, individuals who get away with hurting others and nobody puts up a boundary, they use this as a tactic to keep you under control. Mm-hmm. So when you have somebody who's always telling you that you, you be bad, you're stupid, that, that's what they're doing, this right here, to keep you stuck in this. And in Jesus' name, no more. It's, it's gone. It's yeah. done. Amen. This is the pounding of the pulpit moment when this mm-hmm. is a sermon. You know? mm-hmm. <laughs> and we need to help each other with that. It is part of the grief process. And it, isn't our gr- it is our grief, but it isn't our stimuli. It isn't our problem. We need to get to the point of we can talk about it. Yay, therapist and counselors, talking to your pastor, talking to a safe friend. Whatever is needed, you need to get it outside of yourself and have somebody look you in the eyes and say, this is not your fault. Mm-hmm. This is not your fault. And that truth shattering it shatters all of this and allows you to do what to manage your grief and get out of this process otherwise you're stuck right there Mm -hmm. and you don't go anywhere else Mm -hmm. it's a horrible place to be it is um pastor always you talk about pardon me as we manage our grief and that being a very personal process i'm looking on the other side of it as uh, a member of the that person's community and all of these things that you're outlining for us um, work well in a place of safety, yes. and they get all hitched up um, if we don't uh, do what we can to comfort someone and provide as safe a space as we possibly can, because the safer you are, the the not easy, mm-hmm. but you can work through these steps more readily. Yes, that is so, so true. So as a community person, support, yes. whatever, yes. I can help with safety. Yes. The- the true process of what real friendship looks like. Right. And what I would love to encourage our listeners and viewers to embrace enthusiastically is we don't need to be a counselor nor a therapist nor even a pastor. You need to hear and say, you know what? This has been going on so long. Let's figure out a way to get you in to see a counselor or a therapist. Mm -hmm. Someone, let's, let's connect you with someone who can say, a little bit more informed help because Mm -hmm. we all need it. We all Mm -hmm. could use it. Mm -hmm. And it just helps you process this more readily, especially if you've been stuck in it a long time. Mm -hmm. So our feelings don't define our character. Your feelings, my feelings, your feelings, it doesn't define our character. Our actions do. We do what we really believe. So let's do this for one another. Let's confront lies in each other's lives and in our own life and process them through because that is when health starts to come. You can't get mad at somebody for being stuck in the cycle if they've never had a safe person in their life to talk through and they've never had access. Let's help them get that access to talk through these things and then see what happens as as their grief leaves and growth can come into their world. Amen. I can remember a time um, years ago struggling with something and... um, you made some time to talk with me. It was just wonderful. And one of the things you said, because I was at a point, honestly, where I just couldn't even pray about that. I was beside myself. And wow. you, and for you, you, that's a big deal. <laughs> you know, and you said, um, that's okay. I'll pray for you. I'll pray about this until you can pick that up again. Yeah. And there was something about um, that scripture in Galatians about bearing one another's burden. Man. Right in that moment, I knew you were caring for something that I simply didn't have the ability in the moment. It was going to come. It was going to come back. Jesus is faithful. But y- you offered me that in that time, and it was nice because there was no shame. What's wrong with you that you can't do this? There was none of that. 
that was a wonderful gift. You know, I'll take that for you mm-hmm. until you're ready again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I see that as a living example of these things that you're yes. talking about. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. The, and the benefit, and this is why we work on relationships. We mm-hmm. have this phrase in the women's culture, in the men's culture here at Maranatha, they have a different process of it. The men around here have a playhouse. I can't call it a playhouse, but I'm going to call it a playhouse. <laughs> they have a shop. They have a garage. And it, it has become a wonderful ministry tool. That's what it's for. Mm-hmm. But it's also a place to drop in to see if any guys are hanging. Mm-hmm. The women, we, we don't have that. We, mm-hmm. we have our houses and our texting and our phone. And, you know, however, and we do have women's retreat, which we haven't had for two years. <laughs> and I, I grieve and miss that because then I can have longer conversations with these individuals I don't get to see right. very often. So... We call it the foundational 15, and I realize it's a a large number, and the reason why it's a large number is when you're going through hard, chances are five other people on that list are going through hard as well. And then there's another five that are going to be life-occupied, so you have a chance of five people being able to process with you or be with you. And praise God for Marco Polo, because you can leave videos for people to pick up when they're able to listen to Mm -hmm. a five-minute or a four-minute with concentration and then answer you back. Those types of things... You need to have those relationships, and that's one of the reasons why we focus so much on socialization, not so much not so much a life group per se, but no, let's let's just have this idea of hospitality and doing life together. Right. So these conversations can happen, and you can develop this thing called foundational fifteen, so that can happen. Right. I just need to process. Mm-hmm. You did. I just I need you to listen. I just need to get it out of myself. Mm-hmm. That's an amazing conversation. Mm-hmm. Nobody has to fix anybody or fix anything. We just have to listen. And then if there's a red flag, maybe you should Mm -hmm. consider noticing this a little more. Mm -hmm. Then you move on from there. Mm -hmm. But most often it's just listening. Mm -hmm. So here's managing our grief. Mm -hmm. We're going to invite Jesus into it. We're going to deal with anger when we realize it. Anger is not bad. It's a blessing. It is the warning signal. Warning, warning, Will Robinson, do something. Or they're going to obliterate you with this ray, for those of you that (laughs) know Lost in Space. Yes, there were quite a few last night who knew Lost in Space. So maybe I referred to it just too many times, and they all know now (laughs) what I... And we talked about Gilligan's Island last night, too, so... Don't know where it came in, but Great. I remember now talking. The themes about it. in my I head. Know, I know, <laughs> Gilligan, the skipper too. All right, we invite Jesus into our grief. We deal with anger. We recognize shock. Mm-hmm. I just love that one. We allow room for sadness in our life. Of course, I'm going to be sad. We recognize misplaced shame or embarrassment. I this isn't mine. That one is going to stop us cold until we realize this isn't mine to carry. We acknowledge fear. Fear is a part of the grief process. I wanted that, and it's no longer available. I was supposed to grow old with them, and I can't do that anymore. Now what am I going to do? I was supposed to be able to have children, and I can't. Now what am I going to do? I've always wanted to have that job, but now I can't because it's there. I just got fired. How could they fire me after all? All of that, life changes so much. What you're reacting to isn't not getting what you want. What you're reacting to is fear of not having that in your future. Mm. That is fear. Fear, that is fear. And who is the person who can walk us through fear? Jesus. Amen. And usually he yes. uses the people who love him. Yeah. Making Understanding that fear is a huge part of it. You're not so much angry at circumstances. What you are is afraid. Mm-hmm. And fear can be really loud, just and, so you know. And drivey. Yes, and <laughs> persistent mm-hmm. because you're afraid. It, yeah. it, is, it is like... Watching a, a little kid, one of our kids growing up, didn't understand what in the fall with these dried weeds, they look like uh, tumbleweeds of the Old West, but they're not because we live in Minnesota. But these weeds would die and break off and, and blow in the, in the parking lot in the old building that we had here at Maranatha, come running and jump into my arms because they thought something was coming after them. They had no idea uh, it was a weed mm-hmm. until we showed them, brought them out there. and. Mm-hmm. Everything is better and manageable when you can stomp on it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, our little 18-month-old learned Mm -hmm. how to stomp on him. It didn't change. He still would come around and jump into my arms. But it was more of, okay, I understand, but I just need you. And it didn't take very long when stomping became more fun than being afraid of it. Mm -hmm. We need to do that for one another. Acknowledging, yeah, I can see why you're afraid of it because it looks like this. But honestly, it's just a weed. Let's go stomp on it. Mm Mm-hmm. After we acknowledge fear, we need to manage this idea of there's going to be loneliness. There's a really good chance in this process there's going to be loneliness. Make room for it. Unmet needs. Yep, you're going to have unmet needs. Things have now shifted. Here's what you thought, and here's what you got. Right. And that shift, transition, yay. Sign me up for lots of transition. Not a fan. It's really hard. 
one of the things that's comforting to me is, you know, you talk about inviting Jesus into this process, and at, at every point along the things that you're bringing up, Pastor Arlene, he's right there with us. Yes. And when it comes to making room for loneliness, the thought strikes me is we, we can end up finding God in the dark. You know, Amen. if we feel like we are in the dark, we're not in the dark alone. And it is fascinating. Sometimes when you're in the dark, your eyes adjust, and you see he has been standing right next to you the whole time. Yeah, holding you. Yeah, holding you, yeah, well, That's yeah. why I don't see you, because you're right back there holding me up so I don't fall on my exactly. face. Exactly. <laughs> Making room for loneliness. Things have now shifted. There will be unmet needs. There's unfulfilled desires. There's misunderstandings. Loneliness is, and isn't a good or a bad thing. It's just a thing mm -hmm. that it could be easily be a process of this. And if you are afraid of being alone, if you don't like to be alone, maybe you've never really been alone. Maybe you're an individual who gets charged up by a lot of people around you. Then we make decisions. We shift decisions. I love the idea as individuals age and they no longer have anyone in their home and they make a, de a decision and it's hard to sell your, your family home but they know it isn't their, their kids' responsibility to give them a life. They're part of their life. But they, they move into some type of housing where there's other individuals their age mm -hmm. because they need socialization. And I love my kids, but they're not my age. Mm -hmm. So this is that whole process. I just mm -hmm. being able to, okay, I know that this is going to happen, but I need to be in a place. That is an excellent way to make room for loneliness in your life. Mm -hmm. The eighth thing is defining guilt. What does guilt feel like? Is it misplaced or have I earned it? Have I been part of this situation and helped this thing happen by doing this? And when we realize that we have done something wrong, we repent. It's like, I am really sorry. If apologies need to be made, go apologize. Open that door and let grief move. Grief is not going to move until those things are taken care of. Embrace when pre repentance. If repentance needs to be a part of it, be mournful about sin. If it's your sin has caused this problem or greatly contributed to it, I am sorry. Actually, I find it really helpful to write this down and put a date next to it. So if my body tries to tell me you didn't do this, I'll go back and say, yes, I did. I have asked Jesus to forgive me, but feelings are just really hard. Or did they just come up and they're so intense like they're brand new, mm -hmm. although you've dealt with it? So embrace repentance. Make it a part of that. I should never have said that. I never should have done that. And just write it down. Jesus, I ask you to forgive me. Write your scripture verse maybe that you received in that whole process. Um, if it gets really stuck, you can talk to a trusted individual about going through the process. I want you to hear me. So if I need to, I'm going to call you and you can tell me we did this together. And then living with reality checks. This is basically part of every single one of these other things we've went through, which I will repeat. Inviting Jesus into our grief, dealing with our anger, recognizing shock, allowing sadness, recognizing misplaced shame or embarrassment. Amen. Acknowledging fear, making room for loneliness, defining guilt, embracing repentance, and then living with reality checks. It is so, that is what we were just talking about. It is so important that we understand that this is what my new reality is going to look like. Am I managing my grief or am I really, really stuck? One of the best ways we can measure that is have a friendship that can tell us that we're doing okay. They're more readily available than a therapist or a counselor, but a therapist or a counselor is going to work you through the hard things. They're another wonderful one. Actually being part of an accountable small group, a group where you're mm -hmm. connected, whether it be a Bible study or an interest group, maybe you have a sewing group where you're able to talk about things like that or a golfing league that you're part of. Well, my neighbor was telling me she had a softball, a women's softball league that they still, she's retired and everything, they no longer play, but they still get together on a monthly basis. Can you imagine that? I mean, what a wonderful, wonderful group. Great idea. That, living with reality checks, do I seem different to you? Am I, am I stuck in this? Having people speak truth, because we lie to ourselves really easy, or we don't see our growth. Mm -hmm. We just don't see it, and then we go on thinking we haven't accomplished anything, and wallowing in that type of self-pity. Reality checks, when we set them up in our world, they help us to have hope. They help us to realistically know where we are. Tell you what, I'm going to be sad this week, because this happened, and I'm really, I'm really sad. But will you call me on Friday? and see where I'm at, and remind me, this is what you said. Have you ever had that conversation with anybody in your life? Have we ever? We should, because 
I can manage it. I can do this for so long, but if it starts getting too long, I know I need to continue to move. I may not get out of the grief cycle until my body's done, but I know I'm going to get through this part. I just need you to tell me, okay, I don't think I'm going to get through it today. Will you call me in two days and see where I'm at? And then if it goes on too long, that wonderful person can say the statement, I think we need to go to talk to somebody else. How many of us would never get stuck in this tornado of grief if we had created that mm -hmm. type of relationship before we got at it in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm talking big, setting things up. I mean, things that just most people look at me like I'm crazy. I am not crazy. This is part of having a family structure. It may not be the family who's genetically related to you, but it's a family structure mm -hmm. where this is what we're supposed to be able to do for one another. Mm -hmm. And no, your pastors aren't going to be the one that do it for you. It is the friendships you make within your church community. And guess what? Those friends are going to be part of your grief sometimes because you have something that happened that was hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the human experience. But as you are a part of a family going through the process together, mm -hmm. it really helps you have reality checks that I am healing, I am going through my grief, mm -hmm. I am dealing with it the way I'm supposed to, so I can finally get to this process of forgiveness mm -hmm. and learning how to live as a forgiven person that forgives others. Amen. Amen. So, lots of lists. Whew. All right. Just a warning. Warning. Warning, Will Robinson. Unmanaged grief. When we don't ma manage our grief, there are physical symptoms. You can get your fine self really sick. If you have autoimmune disorders, it, it actually lowers your immunity even more. So you really need to pay attention to your grief. You need to physically do things. I love to walk. Walking is therapy for me. I don't even, I no music, nothing. It's just me and Jesus outside. And it just, it is my thing. It works well for me. So what is your thing? Mm -hmm. What is the thing that you, your physical body has to move? You have to do something because grief is that powerful. You need to do something with your body. Uh, you can lose weight or gain weight when you're grieving. Aches and pains, insomnia. Oh, yeah. You don't sleep. And when we don't sleep, all of this is just magnified. Remember, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. We need to manage our grief. Physical symptoms like that when we don't manage it. Avoiding grief is a myth. It just hides. It doesn't go anywhere until we start dealing with it. Mm -hmm. So you're just delaying the energy. Emotional negligence, not wanting to deal with strong emotions. So when you have a really strong emotion and you don't want to deal with it, what do you do? You keep busy. You disappear and withdraw into isolation. You pretend it wasn't a big deal. Oh, they really didn't hurt my feelings that bad. Oh, I'm just too emotional as a person. No, those are lies. It, if it hurt your feelings, it hurt your feelings. If it was hard, it was hard. You just need to process it. One of the biggest ways we neglect to deal with grief is we use outside influences to numb our pain, basically drugs and alcohol. Uh, not a fan, not good. Mm -hmm. That isn't a something that you are going to need. So mm -hmm. <laughs> this idea of I need to understand my emotions need my attention. Distraction. Mm -hmm. uh, adventure. Going places. Doing things. Never staying in one place at a time. Shopping. Mm -hmm. Incessantly. Mm -hmm. Anything that distracts. Let me distract watching and binging on television. Maybe two days of TV and then you need to get on working through the grief process. Minimizing. Mm -hmm. Never talking about it and pretending it doesn't exist. Well, that doesn't work, but we can pretend. And, and then, part of that lie, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, go ahead. Part of that lie of saying, you know, it happened a long time ago. Really, I just it, I, I just getting it behind me. It's right. behind me. It's behind me. Yes, it's behind that's me. A good one too. But if I haven't mm -hmm. processed it, it's actually not. You're dragging your past trash with you. Yeah. <laughs> it's stuck to the it's back of your shoe. Stuck to the back of your like shoe. Like a rogue piece of toilet paper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. And then lies. Dealing with lies, unmanaged grief. We end up living in lies. So. All of these things are signs when we're not managing it. So I encourage you to look at these notes to access them on realchurch.org and use them as your measuring tape. Use them as a way to help you manage and define what your grief looks like if you don't know what it does. And then last night as we ended, I just want to read this verse because we are each other's support network when we're going through grief. We need to react and interact and be a family and I'm not talking about somebody fixing your life for you or unnecessary hardships on one another. Some people's definition of, well, you go to the same church I do, you should fix my car for me or, or fix all my problems. It doesn't work like that. We are here to support one another as we do the hard work of our, of our life and, and enjoy and engage with one another. So as we ended last night, because just like today, we're all list tired. It's a lot of information. I don't want to feel or think that hard, Pastor. Oh, could you cut this in maybe two podcasts? Probably could have. 
And so you can make that, maybe you already made that decision and turned <laughs> us off and turned us back on. But I want to end looking here at Psalm 30. This idea of Scripture and how it supports us, supports us as we go through these hard things, which we need to as part of the human experience. In Psalm chapter 30, verses 10 through 12, we stood up, I read it first, and then I made them. We don't do that much around here, so it was kind of strange for them. I had them, I made them, I said, you must stand up with me. <laughs> and we read it together. This idea of when grieving is a community process, we do this as part of how we love one another when we walk together through it. Psalm 30, Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness, that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. This is the place that we are going, regardless of whatever we are grieving, to be in his presence and to give his name glory forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us on today's podcast on Good Grief, which is part of our Forgive series. I want to encourage you to go to our website, realchurch.org forward slash Wednesday night and get all of the notes associated with this. And my guess is, as you're watching through this, no doubt either you or somebody you know is walking through the forgive process and could really use this encouragement. Feel free to share this on Facebook or send them the notes, however it is they can get help. I also want to encourage you, come join us. This happens live on Wednesday nights at the Forest Lake Campus here at Maranatha at 6.30. We would love to have you be a part of our Wednesday night crew. This is Pastor Robin with Pastor Orlean and Nikki encouraging you to always be kind.